This video was originally intended to go up on National Tau Day, but in the spirit of Douglas Adams, I missed that deadline hard. <laughs> the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a British sci-fi comedy series. It is one of England's, and fiction's, greatest achievements. And once upon a time, it was big. Ever since the 1980s period of Hitchhiker Mania, the series has remained iconic in pop culture by means of reinvention. Douglas Adams, simply put it, is the master of adaptation. Radio dramas, novels, film, TV, stage productions, even an early form of video game, Hitchhikers has been around the galaxy. And every iteration tells the same story, but not necessarily in the same way. The Earth is destroyed to make way for a space highway, leaving Arthur Dent as the last man in existence. Saved by his friend Ford Prefect, the two of them voyage for stars, escape Vogons, and find out the meaning of life. It's a concept, it's a pitch, it's a playground. Everything else is subject to change. Locations, characters, plots even. Different story beats mingle, return, and sometimes outrightly contradict one another. But more than that, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was the first precursor of the multimedia franchises that dominate the world today. Adams, he adopted it long ago because Hitchhikers inadvertently predicted the way the audiences access and interact with our cross-media entertainment. Adams embraced the process of mass adaptation on such a career-long scale that it became an early example of the intellectual property. You know, the IP in popular media. Today, let's talk about the dominant three, the original radio dramas, the famous novels, and the 2005 Hollywood movie. Sorry, TV show, you just kind of, uh there. Hey, that's better. The career of Douglas Adams is a rare example in literature, film and radio, an author exploring the creative ramifications of retelling the same story throughout a man's entire career. Never afraid to reformat media into new media, Adams had something of a reputation for recycling. No medium or technology exists in a vacuum. The developments of one medium informs all the others. Hitchhiker's story deviates from a given medium by actively resembling other forms of media. The movie takes sections that make it revert to a written word encyclopedia. The radio play is prose, merely brought to life by a performed recital. Even integrating a narrator into a BBC radio drama was an unprecedented decision for the time. That just wasn't done. But that one tiny decision of having a dry, British voice and narrate the guide, give the entire series a distinct voice and personality. And whoever plays that voice, be it a Stephen Fry type, or a Stephen Hawking type, it's always Douglas Adams' vivid voice speaking through them. And he is the one unifying factor tying all of Adams' work. It isn't the universe or the characters, it's the tone and words that Adams speaks in. That voice you read all of his work in? That one detail unknowingly planted the writer into a position of authority. That voice is Adams, and Adams himself has now become the series. The technological versatility of the series would therefore secure Adams as its auteur, an integral component of the franchise. But you can't narrate a film, because the film's natural default narrator is the camera. In 1957, George Bluestone published Novels into Film, and although this book is largely outdated and almost hanging apart, the guy speaks a lot of truth. Bluestone described the film and novel as antithetical, and defined the base distinction separating prose and film by analysing the unique and specific properties of both mediums. Bluestone claimed that film could not project metaphor or thought due to its external trappings. The film, by arranging external sights for our visual perception, or by presenting us with dialogue, can lead us to infer thought, but it cannot show us thought directly. Thanks, Bluestone. Love you, babe. Microfeatures such as cinematography, acting, and expression are supposedly incapable of transferring thoughts and character psychologies. Uh, bullshit, can I just say there? A film is not thought, it is perceived. Fair enough, but cinematography kind of has a language all upon itself. It's designed to lead a viewer, directing their focus. 
Time, on the other hand, does work differently. The novel can have a kind of, like, temporal vagueness to it. Whilst the movie has to bridge the gap between spatial representation and non-spatial experience with cinematic devices, like the flashback, the film has to operate on chronological time. Films cannot channel consciousness or represent dreams and memory as the novel and audio drama can. But that's not just in the visuals. CGI escapes serve the novel. A true test of the differences between page and screen is the story's pace. The novel has three tenses, and the film only has one. In its less restricted mediums, Adams never felt the fast pace demands of sci-fi. Many of the series' most iconic moments are often in the funny asides, or contained within small patches of absurdity. Douglas Adams' writing style was purposely meandering, drifting between narrative and comedic rants and observations and treating both of them with the same urgency. There is no free act structure to be found here in this book. The radio play, for instance, takes over two hours to get to the story's inciting event on the planet Magrathia. Pacing just works differently in other mediums. A novel is physical, allowing a reader to set their own pace. That's the power of the book. It's physical, it has a staying power all of itself. The radio drama is perfect for portraying abstract concepts and sights that were never designed to be visualized. The movie has a bunch of strengths of its own and a lot of weaknesses, but I'd say the standout elements of the 2005 film are micro features that Adams couldn't possibly be given credit for, like the practical effects of Hammer and Tongs, that are unique to the capabilities of a Hollywood film called the perfectly cast leads and the killer soundtrack, they're all cinematic strengths, and the plot is largely secondary. Douglas Adams didn't actually write the final screenplay of this movie, by the way, nor did he live to see the release of the film, and yet his personality somehow still hangs all over it. How does that happen? See, Adams only ever saw himself as a screenwriter, but uniquely during the show's creation, was a writer who inserted himself into every stage of development during the series' early radio production. He's now a famous name, Adams used his unmistakable narrative voice and authority as an auteur to imprint himself upon every adaptation of the series. The TV show, the comic, even the goddamn stage play we don't talk about. Everybody seems to forget that these weren't created by the big man himself. And yet, he's all over this book. The movie ends with a giant picture of his face in a film that he didn't contribute really anything to. Every piece of Hitchhiker's media is obsessed with this man. He is everywhere, and it's not licensing or part of the book's like core identity. It's genuine affection. It's lovely. Hmm, how do I say this? J.K. Rowling isn't loved. Harry Potter is loved. When people say he was a beloved author, they mean it. Adam's own series was more popular than he was, but that series is so familiar, quaint, friendly, that you feel like you know him. I never got to meet Douglas Adams, but every single person who's read one of his books could swear they've been in his mind. Hitchhiker's Guide is integral to Douglas Adams, but that doesn't mean it's his, does it? It is unheard of for the original creator, the screenwriter, to have this much agency for our adaptation to adaptation to adaptation. How can one man be responsible for every stage of production on a big budget movie? How can we credit a writer as the sole contributor in a comic? Adams is the definition of an auteur, and actively embraced its benefits throughout his entire career. Adams lived through the start of an age of transmedia franchising. Other sci-fi franchises such as Star Wars and Marvel have generated huge success by capitalizing on interlocking multimedia products. Many of the largest contemporary blockbusters have been indirect adaptations of successful novels, comic books, and story arcs. I'm not saying Douglas Adams did it first, but he did a version. Successful blockbusters in turn will generate popularity and encourage spin-offs, continuations, and even reverse adaptations across the very mediums that the film originally stemmed from. The current market for entertainment ensures that if content is successful in one medium, then it can be and should be adapted to another, not so much for the novelty of the piece, 
before its market value. That was Henry Jenkins, and Henry Jenkins defined this development as convergence. This is a trend predicted by the late Adams, quickly adopting the early internet and video game technologies as they emerged. But Hitchhikers used its popularity differently. Most multimedia products do so to promote franchise synergy between their media platforms. You know, Star Wars. Incentivizing fans to collect and therefore complete a constantly expanding story. Adams never saw to hook audiences this way. His series had a very definite endpoint, and he always reproduced a familiar story with similar plot beats. The 1984 Infocom game, for example, is purposely misleading and punishes fans for displaying existed knowledge of the series. Whilst this is funny and fucking frustrating, this also displays Adam's contempt for any kind of mythos or lore. It is apparent that despite its multimedia success and worldwide popularity, Douglas Adams never considered treating Hitchhikers as an IP. If such a thing exists, then Hitchhikers exists as an example of intentional, artistic media convergence. Rather than just branching a story into other mediums for relevance or commercial gain, the experimental Adams sought technological justification. Introducing and reinventing the same story onto different technologies. What kind of effect does that have on the core idea itself? Absorbing the strengths of different mediums and using them in tandem allowed Adams to perfect his own original story, revising its work to different audiences as well as different mediums. Although rarely capitalised on or spoken about, the adaptation creates an opportunity that allows for intensive author retrospection. It's just an opportunity that many authors don't take advantage of, because they're too busy villainizing the film adaptation that they so hate. While Douglas Adams ruminated on his story for decades, viewing his episodic ideas as the constant work in progress. And to me, that's why he's different. An author will tell you that a book is superior, a director will tell you a film is superior, but Adams fought for years to get this film made. It's a common demand of pop culture to decide a preferred version of any common story. For the sake of consensus or viewing brevity, usually this role was reserved to either the most recent or popularly accessible version. If distributed by a major studio with an influence over pop culture memory, this is most commonly the feature film. Suddenly, this becomes a pertinent question to ask. Is there a definitive version of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Well... From a post-structuralist perspective... <laughs> stories are an open platform. Literature is irreducibly plural, an endless play of signifiers which can never be finally down to a single centre essence or meaning. Boom! Under this context, all texts have no objective univocal meaning and the audience of text has their own agency to decide. It's an inconsequential question, but it is a habit of culture to enforce a need to find, to seek out the true version. Over the course of Hitchhiker's lifespan, fans, critics, and cultural memory at large have favoured the novels as the predominant superior form of the series. And that's fair, they're great books. A 50 hour novel stays with you, it achieves a certain kind of density. Whilst the 2005 movie, the product with the least amount of Douglas Adams' contribution, is also the least popular. Is that a coincidence? To understand why the novels are considered the preferred medium is to understand what the specific audience values in Adams' work. And that is Adams himself. Although almost identical to the radio screenplays, the novel incites an atmosphere of intimacy with its reader. The process of reading a book could be viewed as purer due to a lack of outside interference. Although Adams was actually met with much creative interference during the writing of his five Hitchhikers books, from an outside perspective, it seemed like the purest distillation of the man himself. And at the end of the day, that's all people are coming to this series for. The film is a weird one, because even if you were to apply auteur theory and only assume that one person is the creative driving force, the film had one, and it wasn't Douglas Adams. It's hard to think about how much first-time director Garth Jennings was completely overshadowed by Douglas Adams. Even in his death, Douglas Adams was assumed into the role of creator, a film that he had almost nothing to do with. 
they kept a couple of Adams' new ideas for the film. He's been assumed the role of auteur, because the auteur brings comfort and mission to many readers. There are just an influx of people who have decided that this series belongs to one person and one person only, not realising the amount of influence those people hold themselves. In interviews, the 2005 film's producer Robbie Stamp claimed that the series was never intended to be a series that adhered to any strict sense of fictional canon. Despite this, a fandom community is still liable to pick and choose the elements that they want to dismiss. Because cultural memory is nothing if not selective. The final instalment in the Trilogy of Five was mostly harmless. And this book is controversial. An older Adams purposely plays outside the comfort zone of his reader, teasing characters and elements that could create a typical and satisfying conclusion, before abruptly ending the series on a dark climax and killing all of his characters. This choice justifiably bruised his readership, and was reportedly influenced by a depressive turn in his personal life. Despite this, it remains the key authorial intent. With the death of Douglas Adams in 2001, Colleagues and fans alike slowly began to question that finale of Adam's final words. Dirk Maggs, director of the later radio series, would go on to play with the ending. In the final story, Adams introduced the concept of a multiverse, parallel dimensions beyond human comprehension, where different events could take place. Cleverly using this, but not quite retconning it, Maggs incorporated the element into the final episode of the radio version that operated within the confines of the canon to create more satisfying versions of the finale. Presenting fans with the ability to choose between medium-specific events and creating a rare sense of reader agency over their story. With Adam's death being such a social mourning period as well, a time when author's sensitive work is viewed as sacred, that was phenomenal. For a certain time, the precious work of a recently deceased author being adapted could easily be seen as an ill-spirited desecration. Any adaption attempting to reanimate the words of a dead man would naturally run the risk of bad taste. So, in 2009, Ian Colfer tried anyway. <laughs> and another thing claimed to be the sixth instalment of the trilogy, and was very controversial. Michael Bywater, co-creator of the series and close colleague, stated that the Hitchhiker series was not branded product, but one man laying himself on the line. To speak with his authentic voice would require not just literary ventriloquism, but metempsychosis. Jesus. His statement goes on to further lionise Douglas Adams some more, but when questioned about Koff's continuation, he states that only history could decide whether Adams' absence from his own series is accepted. And there's a lot of truth in that. Only an audience could decide whether they would embrace this. It's not a shame that they didn't. Man, this book. If you're going to mimic the writing style of a dead man, then at least pick a writing style and stick to it. Go for something radical brand new of your own, or try and emulate his style. Colfer kind of did a bit of both. Ah oh man, you've got a different sense of humour, a confused sense of identity, and generally just a lack of decision. I commend him for trying, but he just proves my point. Hitchhiker's identity is entwined to Adams by design. It is a personality that's being sold. This unique situation is only attainable through the intimacy of the novel, and is therefore near impossible to treat as an accessible intellectual property in any other medium. You can't do Douglas Adams by doing Douglas Adams. It's a waste of time. Douglas Adams, the special and beautiful thing about his books is that you're listening to him tell you a story. It's his voice. In 2015 though, director screenwriter Max Landis adapted Adams' second series, Dirk Gently. A lifelong fan of Douglas Adams, Landis took the exact opposite route and diverted from the source material entirely. Love or hate the series, Max Landis just saw it as a platform. It's an impressionistic adaptation. He chose to adapt the tone rather than the plot. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna waste time pretending to be Douglas Adams. Instead, I'm gonna take everything I know from reading all of his books multiple times, and I'm gonna make my own. And then he rambles like off the subject a little bit, because you know, 
Max Landis, but he has kind of laid out the perfect prototypical adaptation there and followed through. But his point is perfect, and something we've already established, that the main character of every Douglas Adams book is Douglas Adams himself. Adaptations do not have to be accurate to be successful adaptations. If you consider the finished result a successful adaptation, it's completely down to you, but he's used it as a platform, a playground, for his own crazy ideas. It's questionable, especially as Adams was more than just crazy fantasy ideas. But what I quite like is that he's taken an existing property with a recognisable name and treated it like an IP, but not for financial gain, out of pure creative batshit passion. It is impossible to emulate the words of a dead artist. Doubly so in Douglas Adams' case, because that man, goddamn, he's nothing if not a distinctive, vivid narrative voice. In the end, Hitchhiker's success is due to the series' inbuilt flexibility, a flexibility that attracts critics, audiences, and new creators alike. Even talking about it now, I feel distinctly protective of this series in all of its various, very, very cheap incarnations. Because it doesn't feel like a cold, cynical product, it feels like a personality. You're being sold, Douglas Adams. Hitchhikers is still going, without its author, like it or not. But every single piece of media released after his death works as a memoriam. The radio sequel, the lengthy forewords at the beginning of every book, the fact that the movie ends with Douglas Adams' face. Every piece of media is in tribute to this man. The only consistent canon in a series like this is that of the creator himself.